Father, we thank you for your great love towards us. We thank you for another Sabbath, and we just pray that as you speak to us and you enlighten our hearts, we will realize what a privilege is ours to have a connection with the true God. Help us, Lord, to see what that really means, and instead of being puffed up, may we become more and more humble, realizing that we don't deserve anything. We thank you, Lord, that you love us and you give us worth. Bless us now as we open the words that you have given to us. May we sense them in a deeper spiritual way. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You know, words can play tricks on us. <laughs> we can stack a sentence up and look at it, and we say, well, I know what that means. Well, maybe so, and maybe not. Because there might be something in there that is so spiritual that we're missing the whole point, and we need to really ask God to show us, what does this say? What does it mean? I'm sure there are many familiar quotations in the spirit of prophecy. And we're going to read some of them, and we're going to try to get behind them a little bit and see what's really going on here. Let me just give you an example of what I mean. Jesus, at the Last Supper... went into the room with the, the twelve and he wanted to tell them this is it. <laughs> he really wanted to tell them. And he wanted to lay out in front of them what was going to happen in the next few hours. He wanted to prepare them so they wouldn't be so disappointed. But once they got inside the room Judas crawled up next to him on the left side. <laughs> he wanted to have one of the best spots. <laughs> and John got on the other side. <laughs> and the other ones had to take what was left. <laughs> so, and so Jesus, looking at this, he said, how are they going to understand what I have to tell them? It'll just be words to them. They won't have any understanding spiritually of what I'm saying to them. They cannot hear me spiritually. So instead of talking to them, he told them just a couple things, and he saw they're not getting it. He quit. He stopped talking to them. And he just was there looking at them. He was watching them to see what they're going to do next. And they're grumbling with each other who's going to be the highest in his kingdom. <laughs> Here he is getting ready to be the sacrifice. He is sad that he can't tell them what's happening because they can't hear him. Now, he could have said the words. That's what I'm pointing out here. And they still would not have known what the words meant because they were not spiritual. Well, several times when Ellen White is discussing this particular moment, and subsequently, she says they did not want to hear him. They did not want to know what he had to say to them about his dying. And so they just put it out of their mind. They didn't want to know. <laughs> Well, we need to be very careful that we don't get ourselves in the place where God's talking to us and he's saying the words to us, but we don't want to know. <laughs> That's a terrible, terrible place to be because if we don't want to know, we're not going to get it. We are trying to understand here about soul winning. And soul winning is about people becoming like you. <laughs> See? And that's another thing to think about. If I make them like me, what are they going to be? 
answer, yeah. <laughs> Am I going to make them as confused as me? <laughs> Or am I going to really make them spiritual people because the Lord has blessed me and I understand and I want to know so I can obey him? That's why we're talking about obedience. Because if we set it in our minds and our hearts that we really can't obey, we just try it out, we're not believing God. Because he said obey. Now, why would he say that? <laughs> I mean, does he waste his time saying things he doesn't mean? <laughs> All right, so words can trip us up. That's why I'm spending some time with the spirit of prophecy now. We've been together here for several years now, and I have mostly come from Scripture, and then I put a little spirit of prophecy in to show that it says the same thing. But I'm going now to the Spirit of Prophecy to show that maybe we have not understood what God was trying to tell us when we read the words. And we're going back now to see, does that really say that? Let's see. Let's see. I'm going to go to a very familiar place, Christ Object Lessons, and I'm going to start about 156. There are some quotes in there that we all know. But I want to go back to see what's behind those quotes. Okay. Starting on page uh, 155 to cross over. I'm just going to pull out this statement. It's about Peter and the problem he had. He thought he was a Christian. <laughs> and he said, all the rest of them can run away from you. But not me. I won't do that. He says, I'll die first. And he believed it. He was not playing games. He really thought he was one of the good ones. <laughs> but we know what happened. Jesus told him, now, wait a minute. <laughs> he said, before this night's over, you're going to deny that you even know me. <laughs> and Peter said, no, no way. <laughs> no way. And then Jesus told him, before you hear that, <laughs> the chicken. <laughs> and of course, when, when it made the sound, Peter heard it and he remembered. And it shocked him. He said, I did it. <laughs> it absolutely shocked him. And he looked around to see who was looking. And he looked right into the face of Jesus. Jesus was looking at him at the minute that happened. And he looked. Now, if Jesus had looked at him and said, <laughs> naughty, naughty, that would have been the end of Peter. Yeah. yeah, that would have done it for him forever. He would have gone out and hanged himself like Judas did. But that is not the look Jesus gave him. How did Jesus look at him? The way we're supposed to look at sinners that are getting in our way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Peter saw the love coming from him, and Jesus said something else that he remembered. He said, Peter, I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you. And that's what we need to remember. Jesus has prayed for us too. He has prayed for us. And his prayers mean something. Okay, that's a little background for this sentence. Only he who endures the trial will receive the crown of life. So we're all sitting here today. We're here because we want to be. We're here because we hope the Lord will speak to us. We have been baptized. We're members of God's body. We're moving along according to his plan, being transformed in a process. And yet none of us can say, I'm saved. 
This is a trap that the churches have gotten themselves into today. They think, what, you believe in Jesus? You're saved. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. That is not reality. If you have Jesus at this moment, you have salvation at this moment. Yes. You have eternal life at this moment. You have Jesus abiding at you at this moment. But no one is beyond temptation. That's still in front of us. <laughs> and we, we need to learn how to deal with the trials and the temptations that come to us. That's what we're doing. That's why we make a pledge to obedience. We can't say, I'm going to obey forever. All we can say is, I pledge to obey right now, right now, right now, and keep saying it right now. <laughs> you don't know what's going to hit you tomorrow. <laughs> right now, I can obey. Now, I want to ask all of you sitting here right now this second, could you tell me right now, I pledge obedience right now to God for this moment. Can you do that? Yes, you can. There's something powerful about us being together. You know you can obey right now. <laughs> well, if you can do it right now, you can do it <laughs> whenever you make that decision. We have to get over this thing that the devil taught us through some very interesting places that you can't obey. You know, the person that told you probably believed it because they don't obey. <laughs> yeah, they're confessing something when they talk like that. They're telling you to your face, I don't understand obedience. I don't care who it is. Now, don't judge them. We all of us have been in certain places for a long time. <laughs> this is something that once it begins to come to us, we need to understand. All right, I want to move now into this little section. Finishing up this section, this is the way she says it. The same compassion that reached out to rescue Peter is extended to every soul who has fallen under temptation. It is Satan's special device to lead man into sin and then leave him helpless and trembling, fearing to seek for pardon. But why should we fear when God has said, let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. Every provision has been made for our infirmities. Every encouragement offered us to come to Christ. How much is every provision? <laughs> yeah. We need to remember some of these words. God is telling us something in an absolute sense. There's no way to break it down. Every provision. Nothing's been left out. As a matter of fact, in another place she says it's abundant. <laughs> in the Bible, Ephesians 3.20, it's above anything we can think about or even ask. Think to ask. So what God has established is complete. It's full. Nothing's been left out. We have enough. It's sufficient. That's another word. <laughs> what God has done is sufficient. All right. She, she's done with Peter now. Let's, let's look at what she does next here. Christ offered up his broken body to purchase back God's heritage. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost. There's another one. <laughs> not just barely, not a little bit. <laughs> to the uttermost. That's another way of saying what he did was worth infinity. All right. By his, please get this, by his spotless life, his obedience, 
his death. On the cross of Calvary, Christ interceded for the lost rights. Now, if you're, if you're listening spiritually and not just listening to words, what does it mean? His spotless life. I mean, that just went by. What does that mean? Can you in your wildest imagination think you have a spotless life? <laughs> well, then why do people say he's just like me? I mean, that's just three words, and it destroys that. <laughs> I was talking to a fellow not very long ago who said, I've got 400 quotations from Alan White that say he was just like me. I said, oh, really? You have 400 quotations? <laughs> He's telling me he read quotations of words, but he was also confessing to me he doesn't know what they say because these three words destroy his idea of what those 400 quotations say. <laughs> This is what I mean about spiritual. Once you, the Spirit talks to you on any area, it doesn't matter if a person has a million quotations. If it disagrees with what the Spirit told you in that little place, it's not going to change. <laughs> okay. But you need to know it spiritually. You need to know, God showed me this. How can it be any different? <laughs> That's just the first three words. His obedience. What's that? What does that say spiritually? Well, if he obeyed, why did he do that? All the other churches say, to take my place so I don't have to. Are we going to talk like that? <laughs> His obedience. Why did he obey? He came to show me how to do it. <laughs> he came to show me the way he did it is the same way I do it. It's by the Spirit of God. I mean, these words go by mighty fast. <laughs> but we need to slow down and start reading spiritually and let God tell us things that cannot change because they're the truth. All right, let's, let's go on here. Next sentence. Now, not as a mere petitioner does the captain of our salvation intercede for us, but as a conqueror claiming his victory. <laughs> oh, that's so powerful. He just didn't do something 2,000 years ago. Today, he has the right as an absolute conqueror to take whatever the spoils are. <laughs> it's his right. Why do you think the devil trembled when Jesus said, it's finished. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> because nobody can ever change that. There is not a, a Supreme Court the devil can go to and say, you know, I want to appeal this. <laughs> Jesus has spoken. That's it. The devil is done. Now, we need to understand that the devil is not a factor in our experience with God. He's not a factor. Jesus has taken care of that. Jesus will not allow the devil to take us into a place where we have no control. He will not allow it. What we do, we do by choice. Okay? That's right. Don't try to hide someplace. We make our own choices. God in the plan of salvation says the devil cannot force you to do anything. I will not allow it. 
As a matter of fact, all the devils together can't force you to do something. <laughs> I'm pulling for the spirit of prophecy quotations right now. <laughs> These are statements. All right, so let's continue here in this little section. We've only done one sentence. Spotless <laughs> obedience. <laughs> we didn't do death. All right, let's go on here. His offering is complete. Complete. And that means no more. He's done everything that needs to be done as far as offering. As our intercessor, he executes his self-appointed work, holding before God the censer containing his own spotless merits and the prayers, confessions, and thanksgiving of his people. His own merits. Complete. Well, if, if his own merits are complete and they're enough, what other merits are we going to look at? <laughs> there are no other merits anywhere. <laughs> he has the only ones. <laughs> the only ones God can accept. The only ones he will accept. The only ones he has accepted. There's nothing we can add to it. There's nothing we can take away from it. It's there. It's all complete. So why are we trying to get good? <laughs> because we don't think he did it. <laughs> That's why. Now, there is a place for goodness in our lives. But we need to know that it's coming from outside of us. It's not something we're doing. <laughs> The only goodness we're going to have in terms of merits is what God gives us as a gift and works out with us in a cooperation. All right, let's continue here. Page 157, this goes by quickly. Christ has pledged himself. That's all I'm going to read to you. Let your imagination go wild with that. <laughs> You can read the book for yourself. I just want to pick out some words here that have spiritual applications. He has pledged himself to do whatever you understand, okay? He has pledged himself. Can he change that? He who could not see human beings exposed to eternal ruin without pouring out his soul unto death in their behalf, will look with pity and compassion upon every soul who realizes that he cannot save himself. So where is the plan working? It never works where somebody thinks they're helping God out in the plan of salvation. <laughs> I do my part and he does his part and we'll get it done. No, you don't have a part except to cooperate with him. <laughs> what the Father and the Son did to take us out of that problem of sin and put us where we can be loyal, they did without us. Absolutely without us. We had nothing to do with it. <laughs> I want to ask you, when did you decide which parents you were going to have before you were born? <laughs> did you decide that? Did you have anything to say about it? <laughs> you had nothing to say about it? Being born? <laughs> well, that's how much we have to say about being a Christian. Jesus did it all. He 
by his merits, bought us. We belong to him. And when we understand that, we say, well, thank you, Lord. <laughs> he adopts us into the family. We don't have anything to do with that either. He justifies us with absolutely no activity on our part at all. He justifies us through his blood, through his life, through his obedience, through his death, <laughs> through his resurrection. <laughs> and it was all done 2,000 years ago. Is that far enough away from us to see we didn't have anything to do with it? <laughs> 2,000 years is a long time. <laughs> And so Paul asks the interesting question in Galatians. He says, Oh, foolish Seventh-day Adventists. That's what he said, Galatians 3. Oh, foolish Seventh-day Adventists, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Let me ask you this. Did you receive Jesus by your works or by faith? And, of course, we all know the answer to that one. And then he asks the next question. He says, well, how can you be so foolish that having begun in faith, now you're going to be completed by your works? <laughs> That's Paul. He could talk like that because he was spiritual. He knew if you begin by faith, you better stay in faith. <laughs> This is why the Sunday keepers jump all over us because we're not saying it in just the way that they've heard it for so long because much of the time we don't understand. We tell them, well, you have to keep the fourth commandment and that's where we make our big mistake. No, they don't. <laughs> yeah. Don't you ever tell somebody they have to keep the fourth commandment. When we receive Jesus and we're following along in his plan, we love to keep the fourth commandment. That's a whole different thing. <laughs> and when God brings them along to the place where they understand it, they'll love it too if they're real Christians. But we mustn't make them think they're not Christians because we're not all seeing things the same way yet. <laughs> the world's a mess. That's going to be our next subject, Education Chapter 8, if you want to start looking. All right, let's, uh, let's continue here. I'm on familiar ground here, by the way. You've all read these pages. I know it, and I'll prove it in just a second. <laughs> he, through his own atonement, provided for man an infinite fund you like that? You have an infinite fund. An infinite fund of moral power. Is that enough? Infinite? Inexhaustible? You can't ever reach the end of it in all eternity? That's what God has put together. So if we go up to him and tell him, well, I can't, he's going to want to know why. He didn't leave anything out. There is an infinite fund. You see, the problem is nobody told us about this, and we don't know how to dip into it. <laughs> That's why we're doing this, is because when we begin seeing what God is saying here, he's not going to pull these words back. These words are forever words. Continuing. We may take our sins and our sorrows to his feet, for he loves us. That's what we need to get a hold of. He loves us. That's why he did all of this. He will shape 
and mold our characters according to his will. You see, here's part of the problem. We're trying to do it. <laughs> yeah. We're, we go around saying, I'm not into works. And then we say, well, what am I going to do today? What am I not going to do today? What sin will I let go of today? What will I do? You know, that's the problem the devil had. He had eye problems. He said, I will be like the Most High. I will have a congregation the size of the earth. I, I, I. <laughs> Somebody got a hold of this a while back. And they put out little, little signs. What would, ha what would Jesus have me to do? What would Jesus do? That's our first question. We need to get used to that. Right now, this moment, Lord, what would you have me to do? What is your will? <laughs> In the whole satanic force, there is not power to overcome one soul. who in simple trust casts himself on Christ. Now, these are not some weird books. This is Christ Object Lessons. We all have this book. <laughs> and you've all, your eyes have all hit this page. I know it. Going down further, I'm leaving out the scripture she's using. Maybe I shouldn't do that, but you go home and read it. That's in Isaiah 40, 29. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases strength. That's Isaiah. Only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, then I will sprinkle cl clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and all your idols. That's Jeremiah. That's Ezekiel. God has never changed the way he talks. All right, let's move in on this now. You, you may not like this next part, but we must have a knowledge of ourselves. A knowledge that will result in contrition. Before we can find pardon and peace. The Pharisee felt no conviction of sin. The Holy Spirit could not work with him. His soul was encased in self-righteous armor. <laughs> I've got that one underlined. <laughs> self-righteous armor. <laughs> what is that armor against? It's against God's arrows coming so they can't get through. I'm self-righteous. I don't need all that. <laughs> it is only he who knows himself to be a sinner that Christ can save. Now, that doesn't mean before you're converted. That's talking about today. Do you know without any question of, <laughs> no doubt you are a sinner that Christ needs to save? Hmm? Well, that's good news. It's the person that says, well, wait a minute. I joined the church. I'm a Christian. I do everything right. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Jesus said, they that are whole need not a physician. <laughs> now I have this one underlined. We must know our real condition. Our real condition. Or we shall not feel our need of Christ's help. We must understand our danger. You mean Christians have danger? Yes, Christians have danger. They have the danger of saying, I'm saved. Our danger is we will stop depending upon Jesus minute by minute. 
We'll start thinking, I can do something. We must feel the pain of our wounds. Did you know God said that? <laughs> yeah. I have seen people who are in the process and they live like this and they say, oh, there's something wrong. Oh, I hurt. <laughs> there's nothing wrong. God is working there. He's doing something. He is allowing them to see how much they need him. You know the one in Revelation, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods. <laughs> when you don't know, you're blind and naked and miserable. And <laughs> Who's Jesus talking to? <laughs> it's the last Christians on this earth. Yeah, that's the last ones. Now, today, <laughs> Jesus said to the people in the churches, the I say it that way because many of our own people belong in this category. He said, you're blind. You don't know what's going on. You read the words, but the Spirit isn't breaking through. You need some gold. Here's a sentence. The gold tried in the fire is faith that works by love. Okay, you got that? Not faith. Not faith that works. It's faith that works by love. 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, what does he say? Though I give my body to be burned. <laughs> and I, it's not through love. I'm just a sounding brass. I'm nothing but a hypocrite. All right, let me finish the thought now here on that one. I'm going to read the rest of the sentence. Such love as dwelt in the heart of Christ. That's the only kind of love that counts. And we don't have that kind of love without Jesus. That's why what we do trying to, to love doesn't work. It's got to be the love that Jesus has. And then he runs it through us. And then we experience that. And then it becomes ours. You see how heavy these senses get when you begin putting them the way he meant them to be understood. All right. Now, I know you've all seen this because now your ears are going to go, Oh, I know that. I know that. No man can of himself understand his errors. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? <laughs> now, you all know that sentence. You've all seen that in the book. But it's the senses before it we need to understand before we get there. While speaking to God of poverty of spirit. See, I'm telling him I'm humble. I don't really need all this. I'm already humble. While talking to God of poverty of spirit, the heart may be swelling with a conceit of its own superior humility. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't make that sentence up. <laughs> you see how humble I am? Oh, I'm so great. <laughs> I'm more humble than that guy over there. He believes in her. Are you beginning to see that we need to dig deeper? <laughs> we need to go down below the surface and, and get more than what the words are saying just on the word level. What is God trying to tell me? Do I have problems I don't even understand yet? <laughs> Do I want to know about them? 
Do I believe he has been slated for overcoming even all those things? All right, I'm going to keep reading in this little section because we have reached the familiar place. In one way only can a true knowledge of self be obtained. We must behold Christ. Reading the Bible is one of the ways, but that's not the way. The Bible is to take you to Christ. You're not to quit at the Bible. What did he say to those doctors of the law, all of those fantastic scholars? He says, you search the scriptures. You can quote them back and forth. But you are ignorant. <laughs> that's what he told them. You don't know what the scriptures say. You don't know anything about the power of God. They are they which testify of me. We can't quit until we've gotten to him and heard his voice and know that he's saying something to us. It is ignorance of him that makes men so uplifted in their own righteousness. When we contemplate his purity and excellence, we shall see our own weakness and poverty and defects as they really are. We shall see ourselves lost. Did you wake up this morning and when you were praying and talking to God, did it hit you? I'm lost. <laughs> I'm glad, oh God, that I'm not as other men who don't know you. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, where have we been? <laughs> this is where God wants to take us so we can be soul winners. He wants us to recognize we're just like them, the ones we're trying to save. Exactly like them. And we ought to love them because that's us. <laughs> They're not the lost ones and I'm the good one. I'm saved. I got it made. I'm just like them. But the grace of God, he's come to me and he's given me his grace and they need to have it too the same way. All right, let's get in here. We're starting to warm up to this now. We're beginning to see there's more on this page than we thought. We shall see ourselves lost and hopeless, clad in garments of our own goodness. Oh, clad in garments of self-righteousness like every other sinner. You mean there's no difference between me and... <laughs> no, no difference. We shall see that if we are ever saved, it will not be through our own goodness, but through God's infinite grace. <laughs> there it is. That's the beginning of being a soul winner. This is what we need to know. And you know, I have seen enough people on deathbeds to know something happens when you're laying and you know it's just about over. I don't care where they've been. Conference president, drunk, when they're laying in the bed in those last few moments, no more games. And you know what they're thinking? I've seen it many times. Lord, I have no hope except your mercy. That's it. They know it. And it seems to me we ought to know it right now. We have no hope without his mercy. 
But we have every hope because of that mercy. Yes. See? Continuing. The prayer of the publican was heard because it showed dependence reaching forth to lay hold upon omnipotence. Self to the publican appeared nothing but shame. <laughs> so now you know it's okay to feel that. What's wrong with that? As a matter of fact, if you don't feel that, you have a problem. <laughs> yeah, realize it. That's the reality. When you feel there's nothing but shame here, that's the truth. <laughs> that's it. Get there. But we need to know all these things so we don't settle down in some mire and say, well, there's no way out of this because that's not why God wants you to know this. <laughs> he wants you to know that Jesus has taken care of your getting out of that place and developing into what he wants. But you can't develop. If you don't know, you have to develop. All right, let's read the next sentence. There must, thus, excuse me, it must be seen by all who seek God by faith, faith that renounces all self-trust. The needy suppliant is to lay hold upon infinite power. What is faith? Well, the first thing she says here, it, it renounces. <laughs> so, so when the, the, the people come around in town putting up their meetings saying, we're going to teach you how to have self-esteem. That's the worst enemy you can have. I've been trying to tell Seventh-day Adventists that for almost 30 years now. You send your money to those self-esteem people? Oh, you don't know what you're doing. No outward observances can take the place of simple faith and entire renunciation of self. But no man can empty himself of self. Now, I don't know about you, but somebody forgot to tell me that one before I became a Christian. <laughs> oh, I heard you've got to die to yourself. Yeah, I heard that pl plenty. But one of the first things I learned was, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I don't know how to kill myself. And it wasn't until I read this book and read that sentence where it says, no man can do it. Oh, why didn't they tell me that? <laughs> no man can do it. Well, that sure takes a strain off. Let me. No man can do it, so why should we try that approach? Well, what are we supposed to do? Okay, here it comes. We can only consent for Christ to accomplish the work. He won't do it until we consent. But do you know what you're saying when you say to God, Lord, I'll give you permission to kill me. I give you permission to take self out of me. I give you permission to put your will in me. I give you permission to do anything you want. Take my friends away. Take my family away. Take my house away. But let me have Jesus.
Now, we talked about decision. This is part of decision, see? We have to make a choice. We have to know what it is we're doing. Do I want to be a part-time Christian, or do I just want to go all the way? <laughs> well, if we're going to make that consent, here's the next sentence. Then, the language of our soul will be, Lord, take my heart. I can't give it. <laughs> you do it. I have no power. And it's not only at the beginning of our Christian experience we do this. We do this every day. Lord, Take my heart. I can't give it. That's why we need to be waking up in the morning and talking to God and doing some sort of study and letting him talk to us every day and make our pledge again to obey and know that we are in this process. Because all of this is necessary to be a soul winner. <laughs> you cannot give somebody something you don't have. <laughs> and there are people out there who want it. Yeah. They're willing to go all the way once they see where they're supposed to be. And it's a shame for somebody to go to them telling them, this is what God has for you. Surrender. And they surrender. And I'm holding back. Huh? That doesn't work. Lord, I can't give it. And the reason I can't give it is it belongs to you. It's your property. <laughs> Yeah. Keep it pure. I cannot keep it. Save me in spite of myself. <laughs> My weak, unchristlike self. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. These are not just words. This is the power of God. He's trying to communicate to us how it happens, how it's maintained. In the next paragraph, it talks about continually do this, continually. There needs to be continual reaching out of the heart after God, continual, earnest, heartbreaking confession of sin, a humbling of the soul before him. Only by constant renunciation of self and dependence on Christ can we walk safely. What a powerful, powerful two pages here we've been looking at. All right, here's the part I'm not sure you were ready for and, or you wanted to hear. It's from Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36, 31. After you're a Christian and you are following the plan of God, that you are moving through the transformation process through faith, here's what God says to you. Then shall you remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight. Isn't that something? Well, you know, we've had that experience if we've been anywhere close to Christianity and we've been afraid to tell anybody. <laughs> yeah. Because we're like, man, there's something really wrong with me. I don't even like myself. <laughs> but that's God. He, he wants us to know that when you see the purity of Christ, you will see there's nothing good here without him. And we need to confess that to God. 
I know that in me that is in my flesh, there is no good thing. Yeah, Romans 7. That was not Paul talking before his conversion. That's what a lot of people think. That was Paul, full-blown Christian all the way until he died. <laughs> Ezekiel 16, 62, and 63. I will establish my covenant with thee, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, that thou mayest remember and be confounded and never open thy mouth any more because of thy shame. When I am pacified toward thee for all that thou hast done, saith the Lord God. <laughs> yeah, that's God talking to a Christian. He says, you're not going to open your mouth to me anymore because you're going to be so ashamed of who you are and what you've done. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And these statements are all true. This is what God does. He does it to get us to the place where we'll look only at Him. And we'll be thankful for what He gives us. And there are other things we can't get to today, but this is the beginning. We need to see it. There's nothing wrong with some of the processes you've already been through. I've talked to lots of people who get discouraged when they see, oh, I'm so bad. We don't know the half of it yet. <laughs> you know, there was a lady who was told by some officials not to attend the meetings I was giving in that town. Conference people. And it was a hot, hot day. I went outside for just a moment in between meetings, and she was standing out there. I said, what are you doing out here? It's hot out here. <laughs> she says, I can't go into that meeting. I said, what are you doing here? My husband's in there. <laughs> I said, well, well, come in here. It's cooler in here. She says, I can't go in there. I said, why not? And she told me. And they said, she said, they told me that you did this and you did that. And you shouldn't be having these meetings. And I looked at her and I said, well, you know, they didn't tell you half of it. <laughs> yeah. I said, they don't know most of it. But when you go back and you see them, you tell them, it's true. Whatever they want to think about me, it's true. But you tell them, you left out the part for I am redeemed by Jesus Christ. She started coming to the meetings. The Spirit talked to her. She realized there's something wrong. <laughs> We're telling somebody they can't do something. They have to make up their own minds. All right, we need to get to a wrap here on this. I don't know if any of you were exposed to a group that was going through Adventism, pulling people out of the church, teaching them they were perfect and that they would never sin again and they could say, I do not sin, I am holy. That's what they told the people to say. That is so abominable. That is one of the things that God hates when people try to talk like that or think like that. Here's the statement. Our, our lips will not be opened in self-glorification. We shall know our sufficiency is in Christ alone. Galatians 6.14, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Now, who's working out our salvation? Well, there's a cooperation, but it's God doing something in us. We are cooperating with him. We are working out 
what he is working in. <laughs> See? He says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling because I'm putting it in you. Work it out now. All right. Here is a sentence I have marked a certain way so I can see it right away. This is on page 161. Here's the sentence. God does not bid you fear. He will fail to fulfill his promises. Well, if God didn't tell me to do that, who's doing that? <laughs> God did not say, you'd be afraid that I'm not going to do it now. <laughs> These sentences are loaded. <laughs> if we could just live in that sentence for a couple of days, we'd understand. All right, what should we fear? Okay, I'll give you some. They're on this page. Here's what we should fear. And this doesn't mean reverence. This means you shake in your boots and be afraid. Fear, lest your will shall not be held in subjection to Christ's will. You be afraid of that. Lest your hereditary and cultivated traits of character shall control your life. It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Fear, lest self shall interpose between your soul and the great master worker. Fear, lest self will shall mar the high purpose that through you God desires to accomplish. Fear to trust in your own strength. Fear to withdraw your hand from the hand of Christ and attempt to walk life's pathway without his abiding presence. Those are things to fear. Now this one I have marked a different way. I have a blue mark on this one. That means obedience. Every, I have blue marks for everything that God has told us to do. And they're all over the spirit of prophecy. My, the pages are full of blue marks. All right, here's what it says. We need to shun everything that would encourage pride and self-sufficiency. She gives us a couple of clues here what she's talking about. Therefore, we should beware of giving or receiving flattery or praise. Flattery or praise. I'm not going to get into those two things because there are pages and pages and pages. Everywhere in the Spirit of Prophecy it talks about this. This is the way the devil works. This is how he destroys Christians. Flattery and praise. Those who give praise to men are used by Satan as his agents. That's a pretty straightforward sentence. She talks a little bit about self-esteem. I'm moving on here. All right. I don't have a context here for you because I'm skipping through some things, but I want you to hear the sentence. You find it for yourself. 162. All who receive him, for all who receive him, the very keynote of the word of God is rejoicing. The Word of God does not make you sad. The Word of God does not make you <laughs> down. The Word of God does not put you in the dirt. The Word of God wounds you to lift you up and heal you. That's where the rejoicing is. We know that God's doing everything to save us. Here's one of my favorite sentences in Christ Object Lesson. 
Page 163 at the top. As the sinner, drawn by the power of Christ, approaches the uplifted cross and prostrates himself before it, there is a new creation. Next sentence is just as good. A new heart is given him. He becomes a new creature in Christ Jesus. Holiness finds it has nothing more to require. <laughs> there it is. There's our solution to all of this. Jesus on the cross. We prostrate ourselves. We give ourselves to it. We let him do whatever he wants. And that last part, I, can't, I haven't understood it yet completely. It's just so, so big. Holiness has nothing more to require. <laughs> ah! Why not? Because God is satisfied with what Jesus has done. The blood whom he justified, them he also glorified. See, what God begins, he's going to finish. <laughs> Philippians 1, 6. What God has begun, he will finish in Christ. To human beings striving for conformity to the divine image, there is imparted an outlay of heaven's treasure and excellency of power that will place them higher than even the angels who have never fallen. <laughs> That's what you need to, to see. God has you. It's a personal salvation between you and Christ. He has you slated to be more exalted in the sphere of creation than even the angels. Now don't think about somebody else. <laughs> That's where God is taking me. And you know the angels are going to love it. <laughs> They are ministering spirits to us. They're, they're full time trying to get us saved. <laughs> you know, the devil doesn't go to sleep either. So here's the, the angels of God, full time, all the time, all their energy. There's the devil, full time, all of his energy trying to get us lost. Here's these two factions. And we go around yawning, wondering what we're going to do today. <laughs> Maybe we ought to get involved too. <laughs> we haven't begun to talk about the neighbors yet. That person across the street that we say hi to and they don't even know our first name. We're going to talk about the neighbors. We're moving up to that. Because those people are our neighbors for a purpose. <laughs> yeah, God has put us close to those neighbors. So he has somebody to work with to deal with them. I shouldn't get ahead of it. All right, next week I want to try something new and different here. I would like to suggest a chapter or two for you to read. And what I would like you to do is pull out one sentence, if you can do that. It's very hard to do once you set your mind to it. A one-liner that says something to you, that the spiritual content is coming to you, that you know it means you something. And write it down and bring it next week. And then we'll collect them. And I will 
Don't put your names on anything. I just want the sentences, the one-liners, something that really speaks to you. And we will go through them next week to see what God is telling us as a group. Okay? And we'll, we'll try to bottom them out a little bit. We'll try to get into the spiritual content of those sentences and see if, if the rest of us are getting what you got out of it. <laughs> but do that. Don't forget um, I'll give you something that's big enough for all of us to work with. We'll stay in Christ's object lessons. Do uh, chapter 2, the sower, in Christ's object lessons. There are five sections in there. One talks about what a sower does, and then the one on the, the hard ground it got hard because people were walking on it. And you know the way it goes. The stony ground and the thorns and all of that. Read that section through. It's a fairly long section, but read through and get a one-liner that, that really says something to you. And then we'll see what we do with it next week. By one-liner... I mean something like the one we just finished with here. Higher than even the angels who have never fallen. To me, that's a packed line. <laughs> so you will find things that talk to you. And you can write as many as you want for yourself. And you ought to start doing that, by the way. You ought to start putting some things down in writing. Now, we went through 30 doctrines with folders. We are going through a different kind of study now. Not doctrinal, but a devotional study that you need to write down so you can get back to the thoughts. Put them down someplace. Put a, make some sort of a filing system. Right now we're just talking about obedience. That's really all we're doing. What is obedience? That's what we're trying to get to. But you need to get something down so that when you need it to tell somebody else, you don't have to read all 66 books again. <laughs> You'll have it right there. <laughs> okay, let's have prayer. Father, we thank you that as weak as we are and as far down the line as we are in heredity, that you mean to show us to the universe as the trophies of what you can do with humans. Help us to recognize, Lord, that your honor is at stake, that you need to accomplish what you said you were going to accomplish. And it's us that you're working with. Bless us as we see more and more the spiritual reality. And we recognize that tuning into this world is not helping us. But the devil has all kinds of subtle ways of tying us to his, his car. Bless us, Lord, as we seek to be willing and then to be guided by your Spirit. We thank you. You never blame us. Help us, Lord, to tap into that love and help us to see it's the only thing that's going to be eternal. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. No man can empty himself of self. Oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so.